on your right hand side. This is the second tallest building in Chicago because of course we are known for our skyscrapers here. This building is the Trump International Hotel and Tower. It's 92 stories tall and contains about 472 luxury condominiums. Now if you're looking for some of the very best views in Chicago, go ahead and buy one of those penthouses at the top. It'll cost you a pretty penny, but you'll have a neighbor the likes of Derek Rose from the Chicago Bulls and of course Donald Trump himself for when he's in town. Now on your right closer to us now is a simple black building. This is the former IBM building known now as 330 North Wabash. Now this was done in the 1970s by a man named Mies van der Rohe. And van der Rohe was known for his style of less is more. He really didn't like a lot of ornamentation. Now he was a teacher and some of his students didn't agree with his style. One of them in particular was named Bertrand Goldberg. And he felt that if there are no right angles in nature, then there should be none in his buildings either. He is the architect of the next two towers on your right side. These are called corn cob spires here in Chicago, or more phone formally, uh, the Reign of City Towers. Now these were done in the 1960s in a poured concrete style. Each of these apartments are attached to a central concrete core, much like petals of a flower. And if you walked into one of those apartments, it'd be very wide, uh, or excuse me, very narrow at the beginning, and widen out as you get towards the outside balconies. Now together there are over 900 apartments with the first 13 stories being parking. And these buildings might look a little bit familiar to you. That's because they are very iconic. They've been shown in quite a few movies that have been filmed here, including My Best Friend's Wedding, Blues Brothers, and more recently an all-state commercial where they had a stunt driver drive off one of those parking lot floors directly into our Chicago River. Uh, a lot of kind of pedestrian friendly areas. That's because we do have a river walk here that they're trying to make a little bit uh, more comfortable for people. So you're going to see a lot of different restaurants, cafes, things like that. But just above this Bridge House Tavern restaurant, you can see a 35 story glass building. This is the American Bar Association Tower, which was done in 1987 by Skidmore Owings and Merrill. And that glass that you see is used on a lot of buildings on the river here because it does do such a great job of reflecting our unusual color of our river water. Now, if we were around about 100 years ago, we would see a lot of buildings like this next one on the right. It's done in what is called the Chicago Warehouse Style Architecture. It was done in 1914 by Nimmons and Associates. It's called the Reed Murdoch Center, and it used to be a symmetrical building with six bays of windows on either side. But they went ahead and took out one of those bays for the widening of the LaSalle Street Bridge, which we're going under uh, just right now. Now we have a very uh, large amount of environmentally friendly buildings in Chicago, but one of the best ones is just on your right, it's called 300 North LaSalle. Now this 60-story building was finished just recently in 2007. Done by Picard Chilton, it has the second highest certification in the Leadership for Energy and Environmental Design program. This is known as LEAD for short, and it actually uses river water to circulate throughout the ceilings, walls, and floors of the building to keep it cool instead of using a uh, more traditional air conditioning system. Uh, and even crazier, when they release all that river water back out into the river, it's actually cleaner than when it started. Uh, so they're very environmentally friendly and a very small carbon footprint. This is the Merchandise Mart of Chicago. It's one of the largest buildings we see. It has 4.25 million square feet. Done in 1931, it was home to 13 of Marshall Field's warehouses. He wanted to consolidate them all under one roof. But now it's home to over 500 showrooms for the wholesale furniture and interiors market. Now this building we used to have its own zip code. It's that large. It covers two square city blocks and is done in what is known as an Art Deco style. Uh, so it has a very strong emphasis on the vertical. You can see it's done in a limestone exterior. And those busts that you see out front are famous American merchants, including Edward Filey, Montgomery Ward, and Marshall Field himself, who is said to be looking back upon his business, kind of keeping an eye over everything that was happening. Now I guess they didn't feel that that building was large enough because they went ahead and created the apparel mart just to the left of it. And they even attached that building to the merchandise mart with a walkway over Franklin Street there. Now the apparel mart was done in the 1970s by Skidmore Owings and Merrill. And this building originally didn't have a lot of the windows that you see along the front facade. That's because when it was built, they felt that clothing looked best under fluorescent lighting. So they didn't need any of that natural light. But when the Chicago Sun-Times moved in in 2009, they felt that their employees did deserve some sunlight. And they went ahead and put in most of those windows you see along the front facade. Now at the very base of that building is a triangular piece of land. It has some uh, trees on it, also some cars parked. It doesn't look like much, but that's called Wolf Point. Back before Chicago was originally uh, named Chicago,
Chicago. Of course, they had to come up with the name for the subway. And it was in that spot that men used to gather at a tavern to talk about what to call this new settlement. He decided on the word uh, Chicago, which means a lot of different things depending on who you ask. Some people think it means uh, the smelly wild onions which grew along the riverbanks during that time. While other people think it means big, strong, and tall, which is a much better uh, characterization of Chicago citizens. Now on your right hand side are some railroad tracks and these lead to two of our main stations here in Chicago. That's Ogilvy and Union Station. Now when a building is built directly on top of railroads, it's called being built on air rights. And a lot of these railroad tracks didn't need the land or air above, so they just sell it off and the buildings are built right on top. Now this causes a problem for where to put supports and beams because obviously it's hard to place them when you have trains underneath you. Now 100 North Riverside Plaza or the Boeing building had uh, a lot of issues because they're not only placed right above uh, train tracks but also on top of switching tracks. So not only are the trains going underneath the building but they're switching from one track to another and this greatly widens the area that it needs uh, to traverse upon. So on the southwest corner of this building they found it almost impossible to place beams or supports. So they went ahead and cantilevered that side of the building and cantilevering is the idea of a diving board. How you have one end stuck into the ground and the other part just kind of hangs off there. That's what they did with that whole southwest corner and you can see up the top there are those trusses and beams that run along the roof that allow that whole southwest corner uh, to basically uh, stay standing. Now closer to us here on the right is 2 North Riverside Plaza. This is the very first building to be done on air rights. Another great example of the Art Deco style. It was done in the 1920s and for quite a while it was home to the third Chicago newspaper, Chicago Daily News, but they went out of business in the mid-1970s. Now underneath the bridge, we're gonna get a view straight into Union Station. It's at our eye level, very lucky right here. Uh, Union Station, of course, has trains that uh, go out to our suburbs, the metro trains, and also that go out to uh, all over the states, that is the Amtrak trains. Now, of course, uh, not only do the buildings on top have to deal with trains going underneath, but they have to deal with them uh, being here for long periods of time. And this has caused a lot of noise. So the architects that did 10 South Riverside Plaza, which is just above, and the one uh, just uh, to uh, the south of it, which is its twin, those two were done so that they're completely soundproof. Uh, so if you work from the lobby to the top floor of those buildings, you can't hear anything from those trees below you. Uh, but even more so, the architects were worried about all those fumes that were coming up from those trains. So they created a circulation system around both those buildings to allow for those toxic fumes to travel around the outside of the building and up into the atmosphere, away from those employees who would otherwise have to be inhaling them day after day. Now those first two buildings are part of a series called the Gateway Series, they're Gateway 1 and 2. There's three coming up just under the bridge, it's kind of got that white exterior, and four is off in the distance, that darker green color. And these were all done between the 60s and the 80s by that Skidmore Owings and Merrill group that we talked about quite a bit. Now, uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill also did one of the most famous buildings in Chicago, the Willis Tower. Uh, that's coming up in just a second. If you want to get out your cameras, we're going to get a perfect view straight up to the top of the Willis slash Sears Tower. Now, of course, Willis here in Chicago is spelled S-E-A-R-S, so that's because we can just never remember uh, to call it its new name. Uh, now, Willis is a London-based insurance company that went ahead and bought about 3% of the Sears Tower, and this allowed them to change the name. Now, if you look straight up to the top, you can see some boxes that come out the side. Uh, those are actually on the observation deck. You can go outside of the building about four feet, and the only thing stopping you from falling about a thousand feet below are just a couple inches of glass. Now, the Sears slash Willis Tower is 110 stories or 1,400 feet tall, making it the tallest in the United States and the sixth tallest in the world. Uh, for quite a while, it was the largest and tallest in the world. It was done in 1974 uh, by that Skidmore Owings and Merrill Group with principal architect Bruce Graham. Now, when it was built, uh, it called Sears, obviously, for Sears Row, Buck and Company, and it remained that way until recently, as I said, when it changed to Willis. Uh, but the building itself is actually able to sway 18 inches in any direction. Uh, that's because, because of its height, it has to uh, basically withstand all those very, very high winds near the top. Uh, and because of that, if it didn't have the flexibility to move back and forth a little bit, it could possibly damage the infrastructure of the building. We had a woman a couple weeks ago who used to work near the top of the Willis Tower, and she said that if you went to the restroom on a very windy day, you could actually see the toilet water in the bathroom swishing around. 
Uh, that's because of that movement back and forth. Now, if you can believe it, there was a man who decided he was going to climb up the side of the then Sears Tower. His name was Spider-Man, or uh, I don't think it was the real one, he called himself that. And he decided to climb to the very top in under an hour, only using suction cups. Uh, this was quite frightening for everyone down below, uh, but he did make it safely to the top, where he was greeted by Chicago's finest police officers, who arrested him and gave him a misdemeanor for not simply using that elevator. Uh, so we'd really appreciate it. If you want to go to the top, just use uh, the main entrance. It's a lot easier for us to stomach uh, down here on the ground. Now on your right, you see a building that has some severed corners. Now this allows for not only four corner offices per floor, but actually 16. So if you're looking uh, for a corner office, I'd say your bets are much better in this former mercantile exchange building. Uh, now, when it was done in 1987, it was uh, made to have this 11-story trading floor here because a lot of trading did happen in here, uh, capped off by two 40-story towers on either side. I know all of the trading has moved over to the Board of Trade building that is on Jackson a little bit further inland. Now, Art Deco buildings, we've seen a lot of here on our tour so far, and we're not done with those. Coming up just on the bridge, we see one of the uh, best examples of Art Deco here in the city of Chicago. This is the uh, Civic Opera building here in Chicago, and this one was done in uh, 1929, just months before that great stock market crash. Uh, now, this also has a lot of uh, fun decorative reliefs around the outside, just added to the opulence of an opera house. Uh, now, this has one of the most colorful histories in all the buildings you see in Chicago. That's because when it was built, it was funded almost solely by a man named Samuel Insull. And Insull had a girlfriend who lived in New York City, and she was an opera singer. And she didn't uh, really make it in New York, so she came back to Chicago and asked her wonderful boyfriend to please build her an opera house. Now, he was very rich, and he decided that he was going to go ahead and do it. Uh, he made her that uh, great uh, building just there. And uh, the problem, well, there were two problems. The first one being that it was finished just before that great stock market crash, as I said. Uh, so once it was uh, really opened and those shows started uh, to be shown, a lot of people didn't have money, and they especially didn't have money to go to the opera. But the bigger problem was the fact that his girlfriend just could not sing. She couldn't hold a tune. Uh, so no one wanted to go to these shows, and they ended up using a lot of space in that building, actually, for offices and businesses throughout that Great Depression. Now, one other thing that really just adds to its entire history is that people say it looks a little bit like a throne. So uh, if you take a look back just now, I'm sorry to make you guys do this, but this is the best angle you get of that building. It looks a little bit like a high back of the chair. You see the uh, part on the left-hand side that rises up like the back of the chair, uh, the two armrests on either side, and then that main part of the seat. And if Samuel Insel was sitting in this chair, his back would be facing the east. So he'd be turning his back on New York City, just like New York City turned its back on his beautiful girlfriend. This is a very romantic gesture, but of course he did lose millions of dollars in that particular investment. Now coming around along the river bend, we have a building that really just exemplifies the idea. Now this building was done in the 80s by uh, Cone, Pedersen, and Fox, and the building itself was shown very briefly in uh, Frank Spiller's Day Off. Uh, that film, uh, supposedly the father has his office inside this building, uh, and also the parade supposedly takes place just to the left of it down the street here. Now, Cole Patterson and Fox did a few buildings in Chicago, and one of uh, the other buildings they did right here uh, is just next door on the left-hand side. It's 225 West Wacker, and they did that building to be kind of a pairing to 333. Obviously, you can see it doesn't look identical in any way, but it has a lot of those same materials. So as you come under the bridge, you can see it uh, uses some of that same green granite that we saw in 333, but also has some of those porthole-like vents we talked about. But more so, 225 West Wacker is a commemoration of its location between two of our city's river bridges. So look all the way to the top of this building and you can see a fake bridge that actually connects the two towers. Also down the middle of the building, you see those square metal pieces that have little rivets sticking out. Those rivets are found on all of our river bridges, including the one uh, that we're going to be going under in just a second. Now the street on your right hand side that we're going along is double decked as you can see. This is called Wacker Drive. And they say that if you're not from Chicago, do not try to drive on Wacker Drive because it is the most confusing thing you've ever run into. Because not only is there an upper and a lower Wacker, but also a lower, lower Wacker and a north, south, east, and west Wacker. Uh, so people say you can go kind of wacky driving on Wacker Drive. Uh, but there is a method to their madness. The reason they did this was because they wanted to keep a lot of our bigger trucks, vans, uh, delivery vehicles, 
kind of along this lower level uh, to help alleviate the congestion we do feel on the upper streets and also kind of make our streets look a little bit prettier. Now, uh, one more movie reference, if you've seen The Dark Knight, that is, uh, some of those chase scenes are filmed down here on Lower Wacker. You might recognize some of that orange fluorescent lighting uh, that's used quite a lot in that movie. Now, the area that we're going through just now, you can see we talked about the Reed Murdoch Central a little bit earlier over on your left, but this is a particular spot in the river holds some historical significance, and that feature was back in 1915. The third largest maritime disaster in U.S. history happened in this location right here. And it was at the end of July, right around this time of the year in 1915, that a group of people working at an electric company were taking a day trip to Michigan City. Now the company had chartered a bunch of boats to take all their employees, families, friends, uh, out to, for the day, you know, have a nice picnic, maybe uh, go to the beach. Uh, but the problem was that one of these boats that they chartered was called the Eastland. And the Eastland had uh, this bad tendency to kind of tilt depending on where all the weight was distributed. So they had to be very careful to make sure that uh, people were kind of on both sides of the boat. There wasn't a lot of weight on just one side. But the problem was this day, a lot of people were getting on so quickly and they were so excited that 60 people per minute were getting on. And this proved to be just too much for the Eastland. And it ended up actually tipping to its side and uh, continuously going all the way under the water. Now, this uh, was a, a great problem because although the river is fairly uh, narrow here, people had already gone below deck. And once the boat tipped over on its side, all those people were trapped below. And we ended up losing about 850 lives in that particular disaster, including 22 entire families. So every year in that spot back there, we do have a commemoration uh, at that location for all of the people that did perish during that awful disaster. lighter note, just as we come underneath the bridge, we're going to see a building on your right hand side that has a dome on every corner, as well as a very large dome at the top. Now this is called the former Jewelers Building, uh, now known as 35 West Wacker, and uh, at the very top you can see that Belvedere, that's the very large dome, uh, that used to be home to something called the Stratosphere Lounge. Before we get uh, too much information about that guy, uh, the building itself, obviously the former jewelers building, used to be home to a lot of people who wanted to buy and sell jewels. So they take the jewels inside this building, uh, but they got a little bit afraid uh, because they were worried they were going to get robbed. And this was in the early 20s and 30s. Uh, so the architects decided they were going to go ahead and install a car elevator. Uh, so if you were afraid to walk around inside the building with all those jewels, you could go ahead and drive your car straight into the building, into that elevator, be taken to the floor you needed to go to, and exit that elevator without ever having to leave your car. Now I thought this was a bit extravagant until I found out that that stratosphere lounge that were housed in the top dome uh, in the 1930s was a, kind of a speakeasy of sorts and was run by none other than Al Capone himself. Uh, so you can understand why people were a little bit hesitant uh, to walk into a building with all those jewels and money in their pockets, uh, considering that it, the building was run by some of Chicago's best criminals. Now we're coming back to the original dock area heading down the main branch towards the lake. Now before we get any further, I want to point out the bridge that we're going to be going under. It's called the Michigan Avenue or the DuSable Bridge. Now this bridge has a fun name. It's a double-decked, double-leafed Basfield Trunnion Bridge. Now uh, these all those terms break down very easily. You have the two levels of traffic, obviously double-decked. Uh, two leaves of, of the bridge itself, so that means it's split down the middle. Uh, vascular in French is the idea that uh, you have kind of a seesaw, like motion. A uh, trunnion is a pin. So we have larger vessels that are taller than us that need to go underneath this bridge, or really any of the bridges in Chicago. Uh, the two leaves are able to open and close, kind of like a seesaw, on those trunnion pins, and the boats are able to go underneath. Now we have 38 movable bridges along the river. That one in particular was made to look a little bit like uh, a river bridge along the Seine River in Paris. Uh, and you might not have seen a lot of boats uh, coming and going that are larger uh, than what we are because they try to keep uh, that bridge closed for most of the summer and ask for a lot of those larger boats to only go under at the beginning and the ends uh, when you know there aren't as many uh, tourists in town, not as much traffic because it does take quite a few minutes and you have to stop traffic on both sides. Uh, just kind of a hassle for people who are just trying to get uh, on their way through the city of Chicago. 
because those stockyards and slaughterhouses that we had on the south branch used to take all those animal remains, put them right in the water, and created an area uh, that we locals call Bubbly Creek. And that, of course, uh, the bubbles on the top of the surface are from those decomposing uh, carcasses we have at the bottom of the lake. But uh, still uh, kind of bubbles a little bit. Uh, it's really disgusting. Uh, but the reason that they all did this was because, well, uh, they didn't really know any better. A lot of people just had to get rid of their stuff, so they put it straight into the river. And unfortunately, all of that gunk was flowing east into our Lake Michigan. Now, Lake Michigan is where we get all of our water, and it was originally where we got our water, even in the 1850s and 60s. So as all of that gunk started traveling down our river, it went straight into Lake Michigan and really contaminated that water. And people started dying from drinking this water, and obviously as our population grew quite, quite rapidly, uh, we couldn't have that happen to our poor citizens. So we called in uh, the late 1880s a bunch of engineers and architects who decided to do something kind of crazy. Uh, they wanted to go ahead and reverse the entire flow of the river. Now it's said that this uh, undertaking was just as difficult as building a Panama Canal. Obviously not as large, but it was a very difficult process. And what they did was they took the south branch of the Chicago River and attached something to it called the Sanitary and Ship Canal. Now they dug this to be 15 feet deeper than the Chicago River at its deepest point. And of course, water wants to flow in the easiest direction, downstream. So as soon as that canal was opened, it was the easiest and deepest part of this new river. So the water started pulling in the opposite direction and flowing down that new canal. So we are very happy because all of a sudden we were getting rid of all that gunk. It was kind of going downstream, heading out towards uh, Mississippi, St. Louis area, eventually down towards the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, so we were very happy, but uh, don't worry about it. Uh, St. Louis got us back. They bottled up that water and sent it back to Budweiser. Uh, so it's all evened out now. Uh, but in all, you know, in reality here, uh, we did have a lot of that leaving Chicago. We were happy. We were getting the clean water that we needed. Uh, but unfortunately, states that bordered uh, Lake Michigan weren't so happy because all of a sudden they were losing all their clean lake water. So Michigan, Indiana, Wisconsin, even Canada, who doesn't actually border Lake Michigan, decided to sue the city of Chicago. Uh, they said we're taking just far too much of their water uh, from them. So we were court mandated in 1938 to do something uh, to solve this problem. And our solution was to create the Chicago Lock, which we're gonna be going into in just a moment. Now, if you want to get from the river to the lake or the lake to the river, you have to go through the Chicago Lock. It's a fairly simple process for us as a boat. We go in one side to the 600 foot by 80 foot containment area. The gate behind us closes and the one opposite us opens. And the lake itself is about 15 inches taller than the river. So about 8 million gallons of water will rush in those gates, uh, raise us up those 15 inches, and then we'll be at the level of the lake and continue on with our tour. Now, the same thing happens on the way back. Uh, those gates open. We go in. They close behind us and slowly the ones in front of us out onto the river will open and will be lowered those 15 inches so we're out onto the river again. Now this uh, perfectly solved that problem we had because no longer was Lake Michigan's water continuously flowing uh, down our river. Uh, all those states were happy and we were kind of happy too because no longer was our river ever really mixing with that lake water. Uh, now it takes just a few minutes once we get inside and we do ask you guys to please make sure you do not uh, stand or kneel on any benches or seats while we're in here and especially out on the lake or at any time. Uh, but also keep all arms, legs, feet, everything inside of the boat because we do have to get very close to this rough cement wall. Now to get a feel for just how much we uh, are raised once we get inside here, you can't really feel the difference uh, because we're on such a large vessel, but you can take a look at our railings and how they compare to the locks railings. We're about the same level. When we leave, as I said before, 15 inches or about a foot and a half taller than that area there. Now once we're inside the lock, you guys can feel free uh, to take a walk around, use the restroom, get a drink of water. Of course, you can turn around and take a look at our beautiful skyline. It's kind of an interesting perspective. But again, please make sure uh, to not stand or kneel on any benches or seats. Uh, thanks so much. If you guys have any questions, feel free to come ask me. Otherwise, we'll take a quick break and be back once we get out uh, on the lake.
Do you want to get coffee or anything? Um, 